Uh, hello, welcome to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Tamir Rubeg, Chief Economist, welcoming you to our half century mark. Yes, it's the 50th episode, and we have a very special guest with us. Piyush Gupta is Chief Executive Officer and Director of DBS Group. He has been with us since 2009. Prior to that, Piyush spent 27 years at Citigroup, where his last assignment was CEO for Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Piyush, a warm welcome to Kofi Time. I'm very happy to join you uh, on this 50th uh, show of yours, Timur. Thank you. Uh, Piyush, I want to talk about a bunch of things with you, but let's start with the one of the learnings from the pandemic. So um, Augustine Karstens, head of BIS, wrote, I think it was March of last year, just as the economic and the financial gravity of the crisis was becoming more evident, that banks should be part of the solution, not part of the problem in this crisis. Have they delivered? Well, I think it's um, fair to say that uh, banks have come out of this crisis uh, looking and smelling a lot better than they did uh, through the 08-09 crisis. And there are many reasons for that. I think uh, the first and basic is the banking system is much healthier. So banks came out without having themselves a need for bailouts, financial funding, central bank response, etc. In fact, banks were strong enough to build really large buffers and cushions ahead of time. And I think the solidity of the system, the financial system stability engenders a level of trust. So that's uh, table stakes, but that is important. Uh, I think the second reason banks um, are looking good is because they were very resilient. Uh, you know, banking is a completely uh, uh, service oriented activity. And for banks to function with everybody working from home at scale without losing any productivity, any downtime, and making uh, every service available to the consumer at scale around the world uh, was not easy. I think banks have benefited from the recognition that they were able to support customers uh, through this period. So I think that's the second positive. A third uh, positive to me is the uh, first cousin of that. I think banks, uh, uh, particularly like DBS, we also stretched ourselves to find new solutions through this period of time. So stitching up last mile, accepting documents digitally, helping the companies to digitize their supply chains. Uh, all of these were you know, interesting solutions. Uh, but perhaps the most important, obviously, is that we were at the coal face of the fiscal and monetary policy response that governments came up with. So the governments decided to, uh, A, provide moratoriums on loans with government guarantees, and uh, they decided to put new money again with government guarantees. Uh, and uh, because the banks were at the you know, forefront of having to make the judgment, do the analytics, but finally uh, dole out the money, uh, while well, you always look good when you're doling out money. And I think there was a tremendous degree of recognition, therefore, that you know, banks were seen as people who are providing liquidity, uh, providing a forbearance, and that's always a good place to be. So I think by and large, banks have come out uh, looking quite good. I think, frankly, we were, we were part of the solution. Now, uh, there's always a caveat to these things. I think uh, the next year is going to be a little bit more challenging for banks. And that's uh, only because as the moratoriums run out, as the government programs run out, uh, banks now have to go back to the fundamentals of making choices on who do they support and who do they not support anymore. Uh, and frankly, we owe it to our shareholders to be circumspect on our credit decisions. So we will have to go back to people and start calling our loans. We'll have to go back to people and trying to make sure that they're disciplined about payments. And the, that's the, the antithesis of what we've been doing for the last 12, 18 months. Uh, so I do think that there will be a little bit more tension in the system over the next year as banks start uh, fulfilling uh, their obligation to the other stakeholder group, which is the shareholders. Absolutely. And speaking of obligations, Piyush, I mean, banks reside on a lot of data. I know that, you know, data is very close to your heart. And one of the issues that came up during the pandemic last year was this issue between data privacy and the need to sort of track and trace uh, various aspects. And I remember you back in April, I mean, you wrote a rather strident uh, op-ed in the Financial Times. I think there are like 350 comments of that at the bottom of the article even today. And I was struck by your argument that between balancing data privacy and collective action, we the people trump either individual. So I'd like you to expand on that. Well, I'm not sure I would call it strident, <laughs> Timur, but yes, it is a point of view which uh, obviously evokes a lot of uh, emotions. But um, I guess the way I think about uh, privacy is uh, from two or three dimensions. First, um, 
See, in my mind, privacy is not an absolute. Privacy is a very relative concept. And the notion of privacy has changed over time. It is different across cultures. It is frankly different across generations. Uh, even in the West, um, if you go back 1,500 years ago and you go back to the Roman public baths, everybody bathed together, everybody swam together, people had common bedrooms, you know, we were all together at night, uh, people raised and reared families together. So where did this notion of modern day privacy come from? It's, it doesn't go back and, you know, deeply rooted into the psyche. Uh, actually, in some ways, the uh, notion of privacy came from the emergence of the photograph. Uh, when, uh, you know, uh, Kodak invented the photograph is when people started ring fencing, you know, can you use this image or not use this image? So the point I'm making is that it's not an absolute uh, uh, thing. And certainly in large parts of the world, people are less hung up about the notion of individual privacy than they are in Western liberal uh, countries and democracies. Uh, the second dimension to me about uh, privacy is um, this that, um, you know, even we in today's day and age are not consistent with how we think about privacy. Uh, we change our minds about privacy from time to time. Every one of us will say we want to be private. But if I ask you to show me your mobile phone and I look at your apps, every app has location on. Every app is sharing data. You have made a subconscious choice to trade off your privacy for convenience and benefits. And that is true, particularly with the younger generation. If the value exchange is reasonable, they will trade off the privacy. So I think I start with that. The privacy is not absolute. And people are willing to trade off privacy for various reasons. Then you come to the bigger question. So, you know, what are you prepared to trade off privacy for and where does it start making sense? And I've always been a big believer in the fact that there's a trade off between rights and responsibilities. Everybody talks about the Declaration of Human Rights. Few people know that in the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, there's a global endeavor to pass a Declaration of Human Responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That endeavor failed, and it failed principally because of pushback from the U.S. But to me, this idea that we as members of society and human beings have an intrinsic responsibility to each other is as important as the fact that we have a right to ourselves. And when you want to make the trade-off, there are points in time where that responsibility to each other and the responsibility to society, to my mind, is perhaps more important than our own individual right. The public pandemic, public health was a great case in point. To me, everybody is suffering. Nobody knows who can get infected. If you can use data to try and triangulate where the problem is, how we can actually bring succor to people, how we can remedy it, what's wrong with that? And so that was the genesis of the article, that there are situations and points in time where public responsibility actually trumps uh, the individual uh, um, um, need. But would you say that in some cases, the pendulum swung a bit too much and now we're beginning to see, for example, apps have opt-in as opposed to opt-out feature or that in certain sort of social media space, we're seeing some backlash that, yes, in terms of public emergency, national crisis, uh, wartime efforts, there are certain trade-offs that are more stark. But in day-to-day -day life, maybe we have given up a bit too much? So time is a different question. First, the question is really, are the circumstances in which, you know, responsibility trumps rights? And I Correct. said there are. Now, the next question is that are the situations in which too much data has been made available? And I would say the answer is yes, like everybody, I feel uncomfortable. But I would also tell you that I think the trains left the station. Mm -hmm. I think we live in a world where the notion of having control over your data privacy is dead. And the digital footprint is too strong, too immense and too powerful. And today with visual data, digital data, all kinds of data, it's really hard to ensure privacy at any level. And so we're going to have to think about different ways of protecting what we want to protect, uh, not the traditional ways that we've been able to do it. Um, I think in some ways, you know, I, I have an analogy of uh, guns and knives. So how do you, um, you know, guard against guns in most countries uh, through a licensing regime, which is ahead of time? How do you guard uh, against knives? Everybody can buy a knife, but you do it through a regime of uh, trying to determine what was the nature of the use. If you use the knife to eat your food, you're okay. If you use it to kill somebody, you're not. So it's a post facto regime. My own sense is that uh, data and the appropriateness of data use is going to have to slip to a post facto regime where you go back and determine was the data used for the purpose it was meant for, was it legitimate, as opposed to a ahead of time regime. Well, that's very interesting. And I think, you know, even from an app developer perspective, I think that sort of stuff would be 
a very high level of standard to live up to, but I, I suppose you're right. From a law enforcement perspective, that probably would be the most efficient way of applying it. Piyush, so many accelerated disruptions over the last year. Uh, so from telehealth to distance education, digital payments, food delivery, you track all of these. Which one intrigues you the most, positively or negatively? I'm going to cheat that time, but I'm going to mention two, but I'm going to dwell on the second. The first thing, though, that does intrigue me is the exponential uh, increase in the nature of digital consumption. You know, if you think about the movie that was done a few years ago, Avatar, I guess maybe a decade, 15 years ago, it first brought no the notion, this idea that you could effectively live your life in a virtual world and your Avatar went around and did everything for you. I think today we're getting to the stage where more and more of our life is in that virtual world. And this year it showed you that whether it's health services or education services or financial services, people are willing to consume a lot more digitally. And I think this has some pretty important implications on what happens in, you know, in, in real time, real world and what happens in the virtual world. But I think more uh, immediately, the thing that does intrigue me the most is the nature of change in our work uh, environment and our work habits. Uh, I think everybody knows that the whole work from home or work from anywhere that we saw this year was unprecedented. If somebody had uh, told me a year ago that we could run our bank for the whole year with 90% of our people not showing up at offices, office, and it would have been unbelievable. You'd have laughed at it. And nevertheless, you were able to do it. Now, the implication of this, uh, people have not really got their minds around yet. And that implication is actually quite contrarian to things you're hearing about, which is the end of globalization or, uh, you know, the reverse globalization. I think the main implication of this is a massive increase in globalization. And that comes from the fact that the global availability of the workforce and the labor pool is now a reality. When you think about the BPO industry, the offshoring industry, it, it's been important uh, but there are a couple of million people or three who work out of India who do this whole BPO work for the world and everybody talks about it. I think in the next 10 years, the couple of million is going to go into tens and 15 and 20 millions of people who can sit anywhere and work for anywhere. I can see us having a small bunch of people in Israel doing innovation. I can see us having a team in Silicon Valley. And what's quite clear, you can stitch all of these teams together in a way that is seamless and is productive. And that change will be quite disruptive in the way work gets done in the future. I always wonder how the tax regimes will deal, deal with that. That, you know, I work for DBS, but I sit in Israel. So do I pay taxes there or here? Uh, we saw that for some of the people who were, you know, working away from their country uh, of operation. And now the tax authorities are giving them a hard time about how to tax them. Uh, but uh, Piyush, in terms of... Um, professionals versus sort of say the low end frontline workers, the dynamic is a bit different, right? Um, I suppose if you are at an executive level job where your job is decision making and mostly meetings as opposed to sort of developing a specific product, I suppose you can do that remotely. But do you think that sort of the creative energy that comes from people sitting around the table and arguing and iterating that can be replicated in a virtual environment? No, and frankly, even for white collar workers, it can't be. So when I said that, you know, the work will get distributed uh, and you can have teams and workers anywhere, uh, that doesn't uh, take away from the need to physically get people together um, frequently and to recognize that what makes us human beings uh, is human interaction. We're social, social creatures and you cannot eliminate that. So I'm not suggesting that it's going to be 100% you all go virtual, never meet each other. I don't think that's productive. Um, frankly, in our own context, uh, we've announced a whole set of new work uh, policies and uh, we put a cap. You can you know, work two days a week from home, 40%. My own assessment is that after the car wars, if you're new to the company, for example, you can't, uh, you'll probably get about 20% uh, finally who will work from home or work flexibly. And I think that's where you'll wind up at. Um, and I think that's a good thing because it is important to get people together. It's uh, an interesting time to me. It's not just about innovation, ideation, serendipity, meeting people. I think all of those are important. I think it's about something deeper and more profound. And that is uh, what what is our life about? We've all got used to a world where social interactions, getting up in the morning, going out, meeting people, that is what makes us who we are. 
and uh, if you ask us to turn off 60 70% of our life forever you're going to um, have a serious problem a lot of people suffer the stress of being on zoom calls the whole year and i think you've been you to see at the end of 12 months a large part of that stress comes from the fact that you're sitting by yourself and you want to be with people so um, i think the underlying uh, thesis of a change in the nature of work does not mean that people are not going to meet in fact uh, as we think about our own workplace situation uh, we are rearchitecting the office space um, to allow people to collaborate more to create more to come and have more celebratory moments etc but without doubt we're expecting people to be back on education you seem to think that you know there more disruption is possible because it seems to me that the, you know the really good schools have had basically an artificial constraint created around how many students they accept and very low acceptance rate that probably gets broken down with this accelerated disruption i think education is rife for change and um, in you know country like singapore everybody gets a good education but if you go back to uh, uh, india uh, and you explore that there's just not enough schools there's just not enough good teachers so most kids drop out they don't have access to anything and i think that's just going to completely be uh, disrupted dramatically and for the positive uh, but even with education time would i'd be reluctant to take it beyond a point because you think back at your own education i certainly think back at mine and you say how much was it the content that i got from my you know pedagogy and from my books and how much of it is what i learned through social interaction being with people it's hard to uh, you know say that it's all pedagogy so beyond a point in time you still need to get people together so you can learn from each other and learn from real life so i don't think even that is a binary zero one situation but without a doubt i think education will see a, a huge change right no i'm pushing personally i mean i think that the the power of a large lecture room where you have an authority figure sharing insights the live experience is unparalleled I remember when I was an undergrad Eli Weisel who was a Holocaust survivor coming to my college to give a speech. I mean, you can see celebrities talk about tragedy and and in-depth stuff online on TV all the time. But to have a survivor in front of you talk, there were 1000 people, but it was so powerful. It's never left me and that can never be replicated in my uh, opinion. That's my point. I I think they like said we underestimate um you know the sense of touch and the sense of physical presence. I have uh, asked a lot of people this question time or um everybody says you know i am productive i do everything on zoom it works well and so you're on zoom every day with your family with your parents or your children in remote location and you're seeing them every day on the screen so does that mean you're happy never meeting them again and 100% of the people are not happy so obviously just seeing you on the screen is not good enough you're still missing something you're missing the capacity to hug you're missing the capacity to see the full body language you're missing a physical warmth that exists because you're with each other so i think you have to recognize that those things will not change and so when you talk about disruptions i think they're important but in a relative sense there will be a shift from where we were but i certainly don't see a shift going to a world which is just completely um, you know x any human interaction cannot be right i mean it's remarkable that the 19 1920 pandemic was 1890 pandemic was so devastating but by the time it was 1921 22 the world had sort of moved on to a status quo ante in, a may, in many ways um piyush uh, coming back to banking uh low interest rates of course are a perennial headache for banks uh, profitability but what are the other big challenges you are looking at as far as the bank system is concerned it depends on time frames time in the short term the cost of credit is not behind us in fact i would argue that in many cases uh bad loans or provisions or cost of credit um is still ahead of us and that's uh, principally because of uh, where i started the government support programs have been very beneficial in kicking the can down the road but as the programs come to an end when the tide runs out we'll start finding more and more companies and sectors who are not able to cut it and make it so i fully expect that you will see a pick up in delinquencies and cost of credit both in the consumer space as the job doles and job uh, benefit schemes run out Uh, but perhaps more importantly in the small and medium enterprise space the many companies which are just existing hand to mouth particularly food and beverage retail construction uh, and sooner or later when the support and the largest uh, winds up you find many of them are not able to continue to exist uh, with their models so i think there's going to be one source of challenge for the banking system um i think a second source of challenge which will accompany that is something i alluded to earlier which is uh, uh, this idea of the social role of banks um 
a lot of people will have the expectations that banks should be a lot more forgiving, be a lot more generous, be willing to put a lot more money out as people continue to transition. Frankly, as I said, banks have come out looking good because they did that throughout of last year. A large part of that was support of government. Some of it was not. In our own case, for example, our moratorium programs we kicked off way before the government programs did. But there also needs to be a recognition that there's only a finite time to which, uh, up to which the banks can continue to defer their loan collection process or to go and ask you to pay your legitimate interest and so on. And I think the time is on us. So over the next couple of years, that's the second challenge I see. How do you make sure people understand that when you're trying to do your job, a regular job as a banker, you have an obligation to protect the depositor's money, protect shareholder money. You're not just doing this because you're an evil Shylock. So I think you don't have to deal with that. Um, further out, I think there are two challenges. Um, one which has been on us for some time, but which is continuing to gather pace. And that is the impact of uh, technology, uh, which is effectively eliminating industry bond boundaries. So as you know, many in, in our part of the world, the Chinese big tech fin companies have been in the financial services space for several years. Uh, but in the last couple of years, you can see the advent of the American companies. So Google and Amazon and Apple, etc., are beginning to enter the space. Uh, and apart from uh, the fact that they're obviously very competent companies, uh, they've in some cases benefited from regulatory arbitrage. But most of all, they benefit from a source of capital, which is very different from the source of capital of public listed firms, uh, which means that they can actually uh, burn a lot of money uh, in being able to gain market share. So that's going to be a challenge for the incumbent banking system. And uh, finally, if I can add a last one, I think there's a challenge and an opportunity uh, that is around the whole sustainability agenda. Um, see, the particularly the environmental part of the agenda, one of the good things of the pandemic has been a broad recognition that tail risks can happen and it's incumbent on all of us to start thinking about those tail risks. Uh, as a consequence, uh, regulators, risk managers around the world are increasingly focusing on the tail risks that come from climate change or from biodiversity loss. So banks are going to have to focus very hard on getting their hands around those tail risks. And those risks come in many forms. Is the transition risk from regulatory change? Is the physical risk from rising water levels or big storms? Uh, it is the technology risk from technology obsolescence, which accompanies some of this stuff. So those risks you're going to have to think about. But like I said, there's an opportunity in that as well. And that opportunity is that when you see such profound shift in the way people want to build and build economies, maybe there's an opportunity for banks. I want to go back to one phrase that you used earlier, which is regulatory arbitrage. Um, so the non-bank financial system, in your view, is not on a level playing field with the banking system. And do you see that as a potential source of systemic risk? Actually, uh, I think it's changing. So it has not been on a level playing field. Uh, I made this point earlier that many of the companies which sort of raise up, uh, take public money, they, they call it a fund, they move money around, they um, you know do insurance, they give out loans. And frankly, if it talks like a duck and walks like a duck, then you know it's a bank. Uh, but they've not been regulated like banks. And therefore, they haven't had liquidity requirements, capital requirements, supervision requirements. Uh, so I made the case for a period of time that both from a financial system stability standpoint, but also from a, a, a level playing field and competitive standpoints, there needs to be a different way of thinking about many of these players. Uh, however, in the last two years, I think um, that environment has been changing. You can see um, 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 in many ways, there's a backlash against big tech. You talked earlier about privacy and data privacy. So obviously that has some issues. Uh, you saw more recently the Australian issue uh, where the regulators have uh, pushed and said big tech needs to pay for the extant infrastructure that incumbents have put into place uh, through some you know pay for the news, uh, if you will. Uh, if you look at the consultation paper the Chinese authorities have pushed out, that to me is really thought-provoking. They've defined mon monopoly and oligopoly situations. They've defined uh, predatory pricing situations. They've defined anti-tying situations. And they said they're going to try and regulate uh, all of these and make sure they don't happen. Um, just yesterday in Indonesia, the president talked a little bit about making sure that there is a uh, level playing field between online and offline retailers mm. uh, in terms of licensing requirements. So I think uh, the, the playing field is beginning to level. 
Um, and I think it's uh, useful because while you do want innovation, um, you also want to make sure that uh, you keep systemic stability, that you have consumer protection, and uh, you have a level and competitive playing field. Absolutely, absolutely, I fully agree. Um, if you sh I've heard you uh, talk about you know that business as usual as far as the way we run our lives, our society. Um, has, may have run its course. And I remember in a podcast last year, you sort of criticized the generally accepted accounting principles based uh, business model. Um, so expand on that, that what is missing in the way we look at companies or assess their balance sheets? Tell me, let me uh, start with the GDP itself. Mm. You know, think about the gross domestic product is a, a construct created by Kuznets and people. Right. But in the, in the 1930s, in the height of the depression, um, and it was created for its time, which is um, a time of massive uh, um, underconsumption. So the big focus was on measuring the productive capacity and the productive output of a country, goods and services. And we tried, sort of found three different ways of measuring that. Uh, and that's how you measure GDP. It's an absolute nominal value of what is measurable and reflected, uh, therefore, in an aggregate in the GDP accounts of a country. The same principle is what GAP sort of adopts in thinking about companies, which is what is measurable, uh, what is uh, visible and tangible in assets and liabilities or maybe some intangible assets. But those are the things that you can see and account for. Now, this whole metric has been useful in driving economic growth for the past 70, 80, 100 years. So I think it's been very helpful. It keeps you focused on development. It keeps you focus on uh, 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 economic value creation, uh, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but today you got to the stage where um, you start thinking in terms of what we really want for us. What do we want for society and people? And oftentimes it is not just getting more. It's not more physical goods. I don't necessarily need more shirts or more buildings or more cars. You got to a stage where people, at least in many parts of the world, not universal, are open to now thinking about welfare in different terms. What keeps me happy? Uh, what is my welfare all about? Um, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You get to a point in time where you're looking for a more holistic measure of outcomes, which are more than just the tangible outcomes and things that you see on the balance sheets and uh, profit and loss of companies today. Um, this is also important because when you start thinking about the future, the next generation and two, three generations after that, what they will see and inherit is not the physical assets that we see around us. They will inherit the planet. So they're going to have to worry more, a lot more about natural capital, about social capital, not just the physical capital and financial capital that we currently measure. I think fundamentally, the problem is that our current method of accounting does not address and capture what the world today causes called externalities either positive externalities or negative externalities. So we don't price carbon. We don't price, um, you know, human rights. We don't price child labor. Um, on the positive externalities, equally, we don't price somebody who's done work and created incremental education. We don't price somebody who's created better living conditions or health conditions. I think we need a measure of um, uh, accounting which captures these externalities and therefore a lot of people are working at what they call impact weighted accounting. So how can you actually weight what you do uh, in respect of the positive and neg negative impact that you create? Now, for many years I've been skeptical that this could be done because this is all very airy-fairy. It's up in the cloud, you know, how do you actually put a number to it? Everybody does greenwashing, so is it really real? In the last few years, I'm getting a little bit more confident that this can happen because of the power of data and artificial intelligence. The amount of data we have and our capacity to now use sensor technology, data technology to capture everything is immense. And then the compute power we have to run on top of that and make sense of this is also tremendous. So exactly as we're using all of this big data and AI to try and determine you know, on Facebook what is the next thing you should do or who you should vote for, uh, we should be able to use that data and AI to determine what are you doing that's really producing good outcomes and what are you doing that's not producing good outcomes and take a more holistic view of this. I'm um, encouraged that where we are today in terms of technology as well as our own you know, thinking, that over the next uh, decade uh, or so, we will be able to do much better justice to this idea 
of impact weighted accounting and uh, looking at the externalities than we've been able to do in the past. Okay, one decade is very far away, Piyush. As a bank today, how would you influence your investment or lending decision around such considerations? Well, we're already doing that. Um, again, let me answer in two ways. So one, we are influencing it in things which are obvious. Right? Which is, so for example, it's quite obvious that uh, coal is not the most uh, uh, effective way of creating energy uh, when you take a look at the overall cost of nature, healthcare, pollution, etc. It is still the cheapest cost of production in many countries. And there's still many people who don't get electricity. You have to keep that in mind. But if you put all of it together, then it's perhaps time for us to wean ourselves off coal and move to something else. Uh, you can see that for several other sectors, min mining and metals, plantations, the use cases you can find which are easier. For those kinds of use cases, we've actually just uh, put lines in the sand. Uh, for each of the sectors, we've come up with policies of what we will do less of and what we will try to do more of. So in the energy complex, for example, we said we'll stop doing new coal financing, but we will try to do a lot more wind, solar, and renewable energy financing. So that's not a difficult choice to make. The choice starts becoming a lot more complicated uh, when the look-through is difficult. Right? What is the positive impact and what is the negative impact? So let me give you another example, which to my mind is not that easy, and that is palm oil. Mm. So a lot of people raise the question on you know palm oil, but first of all, the science around palm oil is not obvious. Uh, a lot of people say it is a, a lot more healthy than other forms from a health standpoint. Um, from a biodiversity standpoint, quite clearly it's a big negative because you, you know, cut down rainforests and have monoculture. So that's not good. But on the other hand, palm oil, which usually most of it is in Indonesia and Malaysia, is the source of livelihood for 15 million people. And the 15 million people who were translocated by government policy from places like Kalimantan to places like Sumatra, they were given smallholder plantations and their entire livelihood the education of the children, the health, all depends on their being able to cultivate these palm oil plantations. Now, when you try and do the trade-off between the positive and negative externalities of financing palm oil, it becomes very complex. So there is a negative because of the biodiversity loss, but there's a positive around millions and millions of people whose livelihood you are closely involved with in financing. I often wonder and say, so how do you play God? And how do you decide if one is better than the other? So what we've been trying to do is work with extremely uh, well-renowned agencies and thinkers to come up with methodologies sector by sector to try and determine what is the positive and negative impact. Uh, we've done three sectors so far. Palm oil, interestingly, was one. We've done one for the energy sector, the lithium and the EV sector, and a third, uh, where we're actually working with um, uh, people from think tanks, from Oxford University, universities in Singapore, to help us dimension what is the best way to measure these positive and negative impacts. And uh, so far, we've done three pilot studies. And uh, once we've got our hands around understanding how to measure this, we will try and apply it to the rest of our banking activities. But when I say it's a decade, this is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take us a few years to really understand how best to be able to calibrate this appropriately. Absolutely, Piyush. I mean, in my former life, I used to be in Washington, D.C., working for the IMF, and the impact assessment story, uh, the narrative was there even in those days, but uh, at a very macro level. What you're talking about was very granular and, and, and sort of addresses the reality at the ground level. I think multilateral agencies have been remiss in, in addressing these issues uh, in, in that way. So yeah, commend you for, for taking that very difficult approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've heard you talk about it, and it sort of feeds right into what you just said, that you know, ESG type issues are not necessarily an obligation, they can be opportunities. So here's an example where you are telling us that how you can engage in these critical uh, sectors. Any other opportunities that you want to share with us? Oh, yes. I, I think, Tamil, first of all, you know, this whole agenda in the last year around um, what they started calling Build Back Better and some people now call Build Forward Better uh, will create a tremendous range of opportunities. I think industry and infrastructure is being re-architected for the future. And as that happens, uh, people are going to have to build out completely new infrastructure. So green buildings, uh, the energy complex, uh, moving from the internal internal combustion engine to you know either battery or hydrogen, hydrogen itself as an uh, industry, uh, there is going to be tremendous amounts of money going into this building back better. 
And you can already see that. You think about the Euro Green Recovery Fund, 750 billion euro. Or you look at uh, President Biden's uh, stimulus program. Uh, large chunks of this are architected around rebuilding in a different way. In Singapore, I'm on the Emerging Stronger Task Force. And as we're thinking about, uh, you know, investing for Singapore's future, uh, they're really a very clear focus on digitization and sustainability because we think sustainability and focusing on some of these issues uh, will create tremendous opportunities to invest and opportunities uh, uh, for growth. Uh, in addition to a change in the infrastructure and industry, I think there's also going to be a tremendous opportunity from uh, recasting the plumbing, the infrastructure. Uh, in our case, for example, one of the things that we're trying to build out is the carbon exchange. Uh, to be able to deal in the voluntary carbon markets. Why? Because every company in the world has got carbon commitments uh, and the voluntary carbon markets are going to be very, very large. Now, to be able to uh, provide services to authenticate and validate the carbon credits, to trade the carbon credits, to be able to rate the carbon credits is going to be a completely new activity that never existed before. And participating in such infrastructure creating activities is going to be a new source of um, income and opportunity as well. Uh, that's another example for you. Would you want to sort of help the effort in Singapore to bring in more EVs? Yes, of course. Um, as you know, um, we announced, DBS announced the last month, we've tied up with Tesla to do financing for a lot of Tesla cars. So uh, certainly that's something that we are keen on. Um, but there are also other things that we have announced recently. You know, last month we announced with the Inditex, the owners of Zara, a program to uh, do um, to help them source organic cotton from India. Now, this cotton is grown by hundreds of thousands of farmers. We've tied up with uh, 2,000 farmers. These 2,000 farmers, through our supply chain financing and our tracking mechanisms, provide organic cotton, and we can certify the provenance of the cotton and create entire supply chain visibility for uh, Inditex. That's another opportunity. So as people start looking at provenance, looking at sustainability, there are a myriad of opportunities you can create, whether in the EV space as you suggested, or in the Zara example that I gave. Absolutely fascinating. Piyush, finally, a um, bit of a regional uh, question. So we are sort of lucky to live in Southeast Asia, which is increasingly prosperous and relatively speaking stable. Uh, but there are three big undercurrents. Climate change is one. Great power rivalry is the other one. And then this issue of, you know, sort of the supply chain that is getting bifurcated around that great power rivalry. How do you see all this panning out in the coming years? I think the demographics and the fundamentals of Asia are intact and they will continue to drive a lot of opportunity in this region for the foreseeable future. I list a few in those. So I think it's a young population and you could argue that in some cases the young population could be a time bomb in you know the countries Indonesia, India and employment is a problem. But by and large, I think the basic truth that the growing and young populations still drive GDP yes. growth, that still stands. And I think that will be a big driver of economic activity and growth, certainly large growth in consumption demand. Uh, there's also an increasing uh, a link to that growth of wealth in Asia. There are more millionaires and billionaires being formed in Asia every day than in any other part of the world. And when you put that together, I think that will continue to uh, underlie uh, four and a half, five percent growth in real GDPs around the region for the foreseeable future. And if you add some inflation on top of that, that gives you fairly decent nominal uh, economic activity and growth. I don't think that's uh, going away in a hurry. The second fundamental which is really helping is um, what I think of as the integration of Asia. So Asia doesn't have Brussels, but um, that notwithstanding, the private sector and the people sector in Asia continues to integrate rapidly. If you look at even the last decade and track intra-Asia trade relative to global trade, intra-Asia trade outperforms. Uh, but perhaps more important, if you think about intra-Asia capital flows, those have really exponentially grown over the last 10, 20 years. I remember in 98, 2000, the big question mark used to be that uh, there were no fixed income markets in Asia all of the money round trip from the US, well, that's no longer true. And frankly, even if there's money sourced from the West, a lot of the decision-making now sits in Asia. So this integration of Asia on trade, capital, 
I think that's quite powerful. Uh, sometimes people say, you know, Asia grows at night when the government sleep. Um, so not having Brussels might actually be a good thing. Asia continues to integrate. And I think that uh, sense of integration will still be there. That's notwithstanding the geopolitics, uh, uh, etc. of Asia. The third is technology. For um, a bunch of reasons, I think to a large extent linked to the first question on demographics, digitally native uh, populations. Asia's adoption of digital technology has actually been far more rapid than other parts of the world. And perhaps it's just this, the average age in Asia is 27. In the US, it's in the late 30s. In Europe, it's almost 40. And therefore, if you look at the use cases in China, in India, in Indonesia, e-commerce, um, even gaming, finance, it's just at a different level from many other parts of the world. So I think that fundamental is um, very much uh, in place. And I don't think uh, that is disappearing uh, in a hurry either. So I think the fundamentals are in place. Uh, I think um, there will be some challenges. It will be trickier. The next decade will be trickier than the last 20 years have been for the reasons you cited. I think uh, geopolitics was important in Asia's success. Stability in the region was helpful. We are now going to have to uh, duck and weave and to make sure that we don't get caught between two elephants dancing. Um, that's never an easy thing to do. Climate change is a big issue for many of our countries. You know, countries in Singapore, Jakarta, we have low-lying locations. Now, this is not imminent over the next five, ten years, but it is something that is going to focus, uh, uh, get us to focus on a different set of challenges. Um, nevertheless, and in, in Southeast Asia, uh, I do think that the capacity of the region to come together and address these challenges is sometimes underestimated. Uh, we don't have Brussels, but ASEAN is not a bad grouping. And Kishor Mahavani says often, it's probably the second most successful grouping in modern day history. It works in a strange way. Everybody moves at their own bilateral pace. It's not a unified agenda. But if you look at the outcomes ASEAN has achieved in the last uh, 50 years, you can't scoff at them either. So I think collectively in the region, we still have the wherewithal to be able to give our people the livelihood to be able to get growth rates that we've been talking about uh, in the foreseeable uh, future. And uh, my last comment, from a financial standpoint, we approach the next 10 years in a much better condition than we were 20 years ago. We go back to the Asian financial crisis. Today, corporate leverage is lower. Banking sectors are stronger. Currencies are more flexible. Foreign exchange reserves are far more robust than they used to be. Um, so yeah, I think uh, there will be challenges, but I still continue to be confident about the future of the region and about Southeast Asia in particular. I fully share your micro-realism and macro-optimism, Piyush. Uh, thank you so much for your time and insights. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Taimur. Thank you very much indeed. Great, thanks. And thanks to our listeners too. Kopi Time was produced by Martin Tucky with assistance from Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee. All 50 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. Have a great day.